about like uh, how the sausage get made and then like uh, what, what's, the, what's the engine of, of TypeScript. And of course, at the core of it all is a type system, you know, and, and TypeScript has a very interesting type system. Um, in, in many ways, unlike anything I've, I've seen, you know, over time, it's, it's gotten more and more esoteric. You, um, it's, a, it's a gradual and structural and generic type system, and it's really rare to see all of those com combined. Uh, we have extensive type inference. We do control flow-based uh, type analysis, which you all know from, you know, non-dollable types and whatever, and the ability for us to understand how flow of control changes, narrows the types uh, in, in, in if blocks, for example. We have a bunch of novel type constructors, and I'll talk a little bit about those. Um, and then, interestingly, we're both object-oriented and, and functional, uh, which typically is sort of a religious, either you're one or, or, or the other. Now, speaking about the novel type constructors, um, you know, originally TypeScript was just sort of a bunch of primitive types, and then the first one here on the slide, right, you could declare object types and function types, and that was sort of it. And then we've, we've gradually grown downwards. Unit types... Uh, union types, sorry, uh, got added, and then intersection types, um, and those those really fundamentally change how you think about types, because now every root type is not just a single type, it is a set of disjoint possible types, um, and and that brings about a whole different way of thinking, in, in, instead of this single rooted sort of oop like way of thinking of the world, you can think of the world as, oh, I could have a string here or an array of strings, you know, and, and that's... That's crucial to JavaScript. That is how JavaScript works, right? So, so that got us much closer to the, the truth. Um, key of and index access types, map types, and now the last one on the bottom is our new baby called uh, conditional types. Um, and these types are, these are in particular interesting because they, they only exist in higher order form, these types. So, so they, they are only ever there if one of, if, if one of the constituents is a, a type parameter. Like key of t, for example, the minute we know what t is, it evaporates and it just becomes a union of string literals, right? And t sub k evaporates and becomes whatever the type of that property is in, in, that, in, in that object, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But increasingly, our work in designing the type system is actually about reasoning uh, about these higher order type equivalences of all of these type constructors that we have introduced, and this sort of gets a little uh, crazy now, but like for, for here are some, some examples of, there are many of them, but for example, a union of T and the never type, which is the empty union, is just T, and an intersection of T and never is never. Um, if you intersect two union types, you actually get a union of intersection types, uh, because unions distribute over intersections. Um, key of, a, of an intersection is the same of a union of the keys. This, this actually goes a way to, to mathematically explain why they're called union and intersection types and why people sometimes are confused. I, I, I've gotten this question a couple of times. People go, why are, why, why are you calling union types, or sorry, intersection types, why are you calling them intersection types? Because if I intersect two types, I get a union of the property names, so shouldn't they be called union types? And well, no, because the words union and intersection speak to the sets of possible values of the types, the value domains, if you will. And when you create a union type, you are creating a union of the possible value domains. Imagine here's like all the possible values of string, and here are all the possible values of number, and string or number is both of them, right? Are all of the possible values you could have. Now, the thing that's interesting about object types actually is that the most encompassing object type is just curly curly. As you add property declarations to a, an object type, you are constraining the value, the possible values, because you're saying this property is now always of this type. So all of the other possible objects where it was of other types fell out of your possible value domain. So you have these like infinitely large sets, and, but my infinite set is a little bit smaller than your infinite set, and you're actually constraining infinite sets. And that's why it's hard to think about, right? But, 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 but that's why intersections are truly intersections, because they are less inclusive. Um, 
Another interesting thing that we spend our time on a lot, it's like this is like your compiler writer's worst nightmare when it comes to <laughs> structural types and generics. You know, because once you combine those, you can create infinite types that are different in structure. Like when you compare two structural types, like say I have a foo and a bar here, right? For some T and U that so happen to be the same thing, but 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 they're still different types. And now I gotta see, are these two types identical? Well, oh, they're objects. Okay, well then we gotta go look at the item property. Yes, yes, they, they let's say it was foo of string and bar of string. Yep, they're both string, we're good there. Okay, now let's look at the next property. Well, in order to do that, we need to make a foo of foo of string. Okay, and a bar of bar of string. Well, they just got one bigger now and now. Oh, let's look at the item property of that. Yep, that's good. And let's look at the next property of that. Oh, foo of foo of foo of string. Oh, off we go to the races, right? And it's, it's basically turtles all the way down, right? And, <laughs> and what do you do? What do you do? I mean, in fact, I remember we talked to, uh, uh, some of the Microsoft researchers, like uh, there's a famous person, Luca Cardelli uh, from Italy, who worked on structural typing back in the 70s and the 80s, um, and, and, and is one of sort of the, the world-renowned experts on type theory, and then so, great, he's a Microsoft researcher, let's go talk to him. And he goes, oh, that? Oh, no one knows how to solve that problem. <laughs> goes, well, well, what do you mean? <laughs> well, and it turns out that all of the type systems that do structural typing, they cheat. And the way you cheat is you go, okay, well, I guess we'll just keep going. But then once we've seen enough of them, we just say, huh, let's, I've seen five now and it seems to just keep on going. We're just going to stop here and say, let's assume it's true. And then let's check all the rest. And if that also turns out to be true, that's good enough. It's true. You, so we have the, the turtle cutoff. You know, it's, 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 it's about five turtles down. We, 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 we kind of go, you know. We're going to stop here and, and call it true. Um, it's funny, we got this far. We actually got, there was like, just like in the last couple of months, there was finally a bug report that said, hey, I have this JSON document, and it's like 10 levels deep. And I noticed that if at the seventh level I made this mistake, you, I, I didn't actually hear about it. But, <laughs> well, it's the turtle cutoff, you know. That's so... <laughs> So we, 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 we may have to increase that, but it's, but it's tricky. But these are some of the crazy things that we actually have to, this is where we spend our time in, 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 these, in, these, in these crazy problems. Another one is, is strict. Um, strict is interesting because if you think about it, our job really, whenever you update to the latest TypeScript compiler, our job is to break your builds, right? No, that's what we deliver. We deliver error messages, right? And as we get better at checking your code, we deliver more error messages, and therefore we break your builds, and well, that's a problem, right? So we can't be too strict, right? I mean, there has to be a way to control this, this strictness. And so, so in, I, I forget how many releases back it was, we introduced the, uh, the, the strict flag. How many of you are familiar with that and what it, what it does? Strict basically sets the default for a whole family of flags. So now, our, our, the, the way we operate now is whenever we introduce some new type check that might break your code, like for example, strict property initialization got put into 2.7, right? We put it under a flag. Now, you can choose either to opt in manually by not specifying strict, and then you can just, like when you get a new release, it should still compile, and then if you want the new check, you can add that to your ever-growing set of strict things you opt into, right? Or you can go, no, I like pain. I want to be, <laughs> I want to be in House of Pain. You know, every time, every time there's a new release, I want to hear about it because there might be a problem in my code. So you could actually run with dash dash strict, which flips the default of all of these switches to on. And then you can explicitly opt out of the new ones. But you can try it first. So by default, you would try it. And then if it goes, oh, I'm not going to fix that now, then you can opt out of it. So. We actually recommend that people do that. Um, and if you say TSC dash init, we put a strict colon true in there. Um, but that's, that's the philosophy behind this, and that, that's sort of how we, uh, how we operate. All right, that gets me to, uh, I wanted to talk about like some of the new stuff too here. Um, uh, conditional types is new, is or it's gonna be new in, in 2.8, it's not out yet. And that's sort of, you know, our, our what we do here, in a sense, is, is as we think about where to go with the type system, is we're always trying to capture more ground of expressiveness, more ways of capturing patterns that actually occur in real JavaScript. So this is all, it's not, 
This isn't powered by, oh, this sounds interesting, let's go do that. It's powered by, hey, there's this piece of code there that I could not express. Even though it is a mapping that is clearly regular and, and, and should be describable, right? And, and conditional types is sort of one of the last bastions that we haven't gotten to, which is so far all of our types uh, have been uniform in structure. You know, even with map types, it's uniform mappings over type. Conditional types allow you to have non-uniform mappings, and they occur a lot in JavaScript. It's like, hey, if you give me a number, I'm going to go do this, but if you give me an array, then I'm going to go do that, except if it's a string array, then I'm going to do this, you know, and so, and that reflects then in the output, right? And how do you declare that? And that's really what conditional types are about, these non-uniform mappings. Um, so here's an example, for example. Like, think of the type of operator in JavaScript. You say type of x, and today you're going to get string or number or Boolean or undefined a function or object. That's what we tell you. That's what it could be, right? But, but if we know something about x, we actually could know with more precision what the possible strings you could get back are. Right? And so we could actually be a little bit smarter in that check. And so imagine that you declare a type name of t where you say, well, if t is a string, then it maps to string, the string literal type string, right? If it's number, then it goes to number, blah, 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 blah. Um, now, when you say type name of string, you get a string. If you say a, that's also a string. If you say string array, that's an object. Um, if you give it a function, you get function, right? So, so now we're starting to reflect some of what happens in, in the type system. Now, but what if I give it a string or number? Well, it turns out that string or number does not inherit from string, nor does it extend number. It's the other way around, right? Um, yes, string, string derives or extends string or number, but not the other way around, right? And so for unions, we actually do this interesting thing that you saw me to, uh, show earlier, which is we distribute over union types. So when you say type name of number or function returning number, we actually treat it as type name of number or with type name of the function returning number. And that gives you number or function, right? And so these become types that sort of you spread themselves over your union types and apply themselves to each of the constituents, right? And that turns out to be super useful, in fact. Um, but let's first look at what, what, what it looks like in use. Let's just say I declared now a function called type of t that returns type of x now as a type name of t. Now in my code, when I write here, I have a foo that takes an x that can either be a string or a string array or undefined or a y that could be a number or a function returning number. Now when I say tx is type of x, I get string or object or undefined. And if I now have an if statement where I try to compare that to function, you're going to get an error saying this could never be a function. You're wasting your time here. You know, so, so already you can see how this, this, is, this is useful, right? Um, but here's where it starts to become really interesting. Um, you can declare these types that, that reduce or filter your union types. So for example, here's an exclude and an extract function. You give it two types and it gets rid of all the u likes in t or extracts all the u likes from t. So, so let me show you some examples here. Let's say I have a or b or c or d and from that I exclude a or c or f and then I get back B or D. Because we spread it over the union, right? And then if we evaluate to never, it goes away. Otherwise, you get T, then you, you keep it, right? And, or vice versa for, for extract. Um, and that's like useful, like let's say I have something that is of type string or number or function returning void or whatever, and I wanna get, all the f I wanna get rid of all the functions from that type. This is how you would do that. Or I want to extract all of the functions from that type. This, this, this is what you do with this guy. But notice how this is all built out of this one primitive, right? You can actually make new type operators yourself using, using these things, um, such as non-nullable. Get rid of null and undefined for my type. Now that one, everyone's asked for that one. So all of a sudden, oh, oh this, this sort of fell in our laps, right? Um, um, here, non-nullable, uh, string or number undefined is string or number uh, because we just get rid of 
whatever parts of the union are not interesting. An additional capability we have in uh, conditional types is the ability to infer constituent types. So imagine you want to write flatten, or maybe it's smush, smushin of T. <laughs> um, you could write it as, when T extends array of mumble, then I'd like to return the mumble, otherwise I'd like to return T, right? Um, and now, if you give me a string, you get back string, but if you give me a string array, you get back string, because we fish it out of, and so we can actually sort of reach into types, fish out constituents, and return them to you. Uh, and you might go, well, where is that useful then? Well, how about return type of T? Now, that's another one that everyone has asked for, right? How do I, I have a T, I want to get the return type of that T. How do I get that? Well, here's, here's how you do it. You say when t extends a function taking any set of arguments and some return type, then give me that return type. Otherwise, just give me t. Um, this turns out to be useful in the real world in like, let's say I wrote a function foo that returns some insanely complicated type that got inferred and I don't even know how to write it down. Well, now I can just say return type of type of foo and, and obtain that type without having to explicitly write it down myself. Uh, so these are just sort of some of the, some of the interesting types uh, you can do. Now, but as I said, you can use it to make your own type operator. So in lib.d.ts, we already have partial read-only, pick, and record. I'm sure some of you have, have used those at times. And now in 2.8, there'll be five new ones. Uh, well, six new ones, actually. There'll be a required of t that allows you to do the opposite of partial, which that's actually not related to, to conditional types, but a ex little extension to map types. But then we have exclude, extract, non-nullable, return type, and instance type that allows you to get the return type of functions and the return type of constructor functions and, and do funny transformations on, on union types. But for me, as a type system wonk, the beauty of this is that this is built out of just four novel type constructors, right? That and we didn't have to put in like dollar this or dollar that built-in function or built-in type, you know, that only the type system knows how to write. It's all just, it just emerges out of these underlying quarks. <laughs> um, that's always like, it's always fun uh, to have that kind of beauty. Um, all right. Um, how am I doing on time here? Uh, sort of okay. Let me try to show you a little bit of conditional.